Welcome to the latest edition of Astroveo's <laughs> Coast to Coast Podcast of Science, Astronomy in the World About Us. My name is Joseph, he's David, the laughing one, and we're just two friends who happen to be professional astronomers with a deep love of telescopes, astrophysics, and all things <laughs> science. We've got a great show for you guys today. Today we'll be talking about imaging a black hole with a telescope the size of the whole Earth, robotic telescope ne networks, these are telescopes that are linked electronically around the globe, and a recently discovered celestial object with an unusually high albedo, which after some Googling turned out to be the moon. So, <laughs> David, you want to dive us into our black hole topic? Yes, well, thank you after such a wonderful introduction, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> dear, dear, dear. This is where the viewers think, what are we talking about? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, yeah, as you know, because uh, both you and I are members of this collaboration, uh, there's a, a very large international collaboration in um, well, over the last decade or so uh, called the Event Horizon Telescope, Put together the, the resources, the infrastructure, the telescopes in place, recording devices, and so on, to image uh, two very specific, or at least two very specific, black holes. Uh, and so we put the first image out in uh, April 2019, if you remember. It was the um, the big uh, orange donut-looking image. Oh, there it is. Yep, yep. Of uh, the nearby galaxy M87. So this is the black hole at the very center of that galaxy. Uh, and both Joseph and I were, uh, and still actually still remain, uh, in, an integral part of this collaboration, the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, and so, Joseph, would you like to explain your role, and then I can do mine, and we can get onto the sort of juicy stuff. Sure thing. Uh, yeah. So David and I are both uh, members of the EHT collaboration. Uh, we're both active physicists uh, working on it. Um, so I, uh, my role is primarily in the data analysis end, specifically uh, the way we make these images and measurements, um, the processes uh, called imaging and modeling. Um, so I helped develop the imaging algorithms that we uh, and software that we make to uh, uh, produce these algorithms, and then I help interpret them by developing and fitting uh, models to the data. Um, my uh, but one of the largest contributions to the collaboration, I uh, was one of the lead author. I was the lead author on one of the ten papers that was published uh, describing the information behind the second image of a black hole, uh, the image of Sagittarius Star. And for any noise you hear in the background, that would be Astro Puppy. <laughs> so Hi, Astro he's Puppy. also he is not an integral member of the EHT collaboration. <laughs> well, he should be. He should be honestly just yeah. emotional contributions. Yeah. Yeah. Imaging Puppy. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, that was a pretty nice description. Thank you, uh, Joseph. Um, uh, before I go on to my part, uh, you should know that the Event Horizon Telescope is actually a collaboration of, of well over 300 collaborators now. And we're talking about scientists and coders and technicians and uh, observatory staff. We are talking about telescope directors, the staff that run the observatories themselves, uh, administrators and facilitators. We're, we're a really big group. Uh, the it, it's also uh, it's also worth noting too that it's not just a big group like worldwide, but also it's kind of crazy that the EHT has all the people all the way from undergraduates to like yeah. grad students, postdocs, you know, professors, all the way up to like full tenured faculty. It's like it's really wild. Yeah, no, there's all kinds of career stages. That's a really important point, Joseph. That uh, yeah, we're not we're not. We're, I would say we're fairly top heavy. We've got a lot of the sort of career scientists who are um, sort of my stage of their career and above. Um, but there are an awful lot of young, uh, early career scientists as well. Um, and in fact, to be honest, they're the driving force. They're the real energy of the collaboration. Um, and they sort of put up with us, uh, all fogies. And we, there's uh, 13 principal uh, stakeholders uh, as institutes that uh, sort of collaborated on this to begin with. Uh, and there are many supporting contributor uh, institutes as well. And so my role in the, in the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, at least a few years ago, I, I've moved on slightly, was uh, program management of uh, basically putting uh, all the ne necessary uh, finances in place, uh, making sure the uh, work teams were able to follow the project plans, uh, talking to the various funding agencies from around the world in terms of, you know, what the funding that we received, you know, taxpayers' money oftentimes, uh, and including some private uh, donations, uh, and making sure that we were sort of doing we, what we were supposed to be doing when we were supposed to do, be doing it. So I helped a great deal with the scheduling and the sort of keeping everybody on track. Um, I also was a, a big part of the array uh, uh, coordination group. So basically making sure the telescope, the telescopes, the instrumentations uh, were ready for observing, which was really nice. And I did a wee bit of science, uh, although nowhere near at the level of you, Joseph. So uh, your Python skills were a little bit above mine. So, so yeah, I think, I think uh, your science interpretation was a far greater contribution than me. 
Uh, that's an extreme exaggeration. <laughs> I'd like to, what's the uh, Twitter? The, sorry, excuse me, X, the, the feature. It's like a, users would like to clarify the misinformation here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, we both contributed. Let's put it like that. Um, also, you're so underrating this... your ability to get 300 cats running in the same direction. <laughs> I do. If that is any skill, yes, I definitely had that skill. That it's quite hard. Yeah. Just getting people to, to do the to do the things they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do them and without sort of shouting at each other and niggling and you know be acting like 13 year olds. You know, that's uh, that was a pretty big thing to be able to do. Uh, so the event environment, let's talk a little bit about the event horizon telescope itself. It sounds like it's one telescope. Is, is that true? No, so the Event Horizon Telescope, where we say it's a global telescope, uh, and it is true that it ha has the resolving power equivalent to a telescope the size of the Earth, but it's actually a gigantic network of telescopes all over the world. Um, and so in 2017, we made the took the data for the first image of a black hole. I believe we had eight sort of geographically distinct stations, um, and now we've got quite a few more. But uh, these telescopes are spread all around the world. Um, and uh, they we link them up together via a technique called very long baseline interferometry. All you need to know is that uh, about VLBI, as it's called, is that it allows us to take these relatively small telescopes. They're not small at all. Some of them are actually the largest radio telescopes in the world, uh, or the largest you know single moving dishes and stuff. Uh, we take these rel these relatively smaller telescopes and uh, link them together into a single telescope that has far greater resolution than any of the individual ones. Um, and that's the magic of how the EHD functions. So it's a network of radio telescopes that are all functioning as one. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good, good way of putting it. I think one of the you know, one of the real biggies here is, and you can see from the image you've thrown up on the screen here, is uh, the distributed network is, of course, across many uh, continents. But the fact this one down here at the bottom, SPT, which is the South Pole Telescope, um, that's really important because but one of the things that turns out to be important in VLBI, the very long, the VL, is that having a long baseline between the systems really allows you to get high spatial uh, resolution. And so the fact you've got this one geographically distinct uh, telescope way down there in Antarctica, uh, obviously one of the driest places in Earth, uh, on Earth, so that's really nice uh, as well for, for the weather. Um, but the fact it's so far away from Alma and Apex in Chile and from the 30 meter in Spain and, and the, the two telescopes over there in, um, in Hawaii in the, in the Pacific is the baselines are so huge that means you really do get that very, very fine spatial resolution, which is absolutely critical to, to imaging a black hole. But don't forget, there are some downsides. They're not real downsides, but if you're ever curious as to, you know, we mentioned that we took these observations in 2017, but it took us until 2019 to publish the data. It did take a good amount of time to analyze and produce the image, but it's because of these remote inaccessible sites like SPT yeah. that made it impossible to get the data back on a short time scale. So. You know, if you try to upload the ESGA takes an order of like multiple petabytes of data throughout the 2017 observation. If That's you wanted huge. to upload that over the over even over a very good internet connection, you're talking 30 years. So it was actually faster just to put all the data on these giant hard drives and fly them uh, back to for analysis. But with the SPT, there's only two planes basically that go in and out of Antarctica twice a year when it's not you know snowing cats and dogs. Um, no offense, Astro Puppy. Um, and, uh, uh, so as a result, we had to wait, you know, six months to get the data from, uh, from SPT. Uh, and that's just uh, one of the many in fascinating and like very intriguing technological challenges with the array as a whole. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Well, of course we're in a similar position, not, not quite from the logistics point of view, but the ones, uh, the telescope uh, that's been added recently up there in Greenland, you know, also very inhospo inhospitable. Um, when it's uh, when it's winter time up there, so yeah, very very difficult uh, conditions for humans to operate in, and just the mechanics of the telescope itself. Um, so interesting question, and I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you can answer this really succinctly. Uh, we tell we took we've got a couple of sites where there are two telescopes. Uh, one is in in Chile with Alma Apex. Uh, they're they're not co-located, but they're fairly close. I can't remember the exact distance, but it's something like you know twenty or thirty miles. And then there, is, there are the two telescopes there on top of Mauna Kea in, in Hawaii. What's the use in having two telescopes and very close together? Why would we bother? Why don't we just want to spread them out as much as possible? So a couple of reasons that immediately come to mind. Uh, one, if you have the two telescopes that are relatively close together, you get uh, 
very, very similar bass lines, but on two, on two separate combinations of instruments. And so you can calibrate them to each other, those bass lines, uh, because they effectively are measuring the same quantity. The second reason that immediately comes to mind is while longer bass lines will give you better resolution because they're placed farther apart, we also want accurate measurements of things like the total uh, intensity of the source. And those can only be determined from the very shortest baselines because it's essentially like saying, if, you wanna, if you're looking at an image and you want to calculate all the photons in the image, you don't care about the detail. You actually want the worst resolution possible so you can just see the total number of photons that you're collecting. Um, and so by put it, taking having a really short baseline like um, ALMA and OPEX in Chile or uh, SMA and JCMT in Hawaii, uh, we're effectively like taking off the glasses of the EHT and be like, what's just the overall brightness of this thing? Those are the two reasons yeah. I can think of immediately. Was there any other you had in mind? No, no, I think you explained that really well. I mean, they're very good sort of internal calibrators. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the real difficulties in, in putting together eight or nine telescope or data sets uh, such, uh, such, uh, with such geographical uh, dis dispersion across the, the globe. It's just combining those data sets both in time um, and in, in energy is very, very difficult. So having two co-located co telescopes or very closely located telescopes really allows you to take out a lot of those calibration difficulties, which are 100% right uh, is the exact reason why we do it. And th this so kind of just... self-calibration is this kind of self-calibration is so important when you're taking an image of something that's never been seen yeah. before with an instrument right. that's never been used on that or anything else. <laughs> so like making yeah, sure you got right. the right answer, that's a tough problem. Yeah, it really is. Well, not necessarily the right answer. It's not the answer you're looking for, which is one of the, you know, a great sort of um, thing in science we really aim to do is that we really try to not to work toward an answer. We really try to work toward the truth. Um, but, but knowing the fact that it works correctly as in the instrumentation yeah. is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, so do me a favor, throw the image of the, of the black holes up again, please, the, our wonderful donuts. Sure. <laughs> our eyes of Sauron. Yeah, I, our eyes of Sauron, <laughs> I like that, very nice. Yeah, so, uh, we're okay. oh yeah, there you go, M87 on top, Sad J star on the bottom. So here's a question I think we should answer, and I think it's important because I ask myself this a lot, certainly as a taxpayer, um, but also just as a scientist. <laughs> And when you pay those taxes, you want to know why people are doing these things, right? Who, who cares? Why should we be imaging black holes? What do we get out of it? Why should Joe or Joanna Public care about what we do? Uh, so I have a very big picture answer to that. Um, but so do you want to you want to cover any like uh, like more black like black scientific reasons? I can talk about what, like the philosophy of these kinds of questions. Yeah, well, I think I think one of the biggest things, I th and this probably ties into your philosophy, I suspect, but one of the biggest reasons why we, we did this project in particular is because we're always looking for a way to test Einstein. And Einstein is, is sort of prevalent in all kinds of ways in our life. But even things like GPS, for instance, the GPS satellite system does not work without Einstein's corrections to um, general relativity. And so Einstein turns out to be all over the place, and he's never been proved wrong. And so what that means is in any experiment we try to come up with, both in the near term, both in uh, what I mean by that is even uh, with things like solar system objects, which we observed in, in 1919 to try and prove his theories, um, and uh, the kind of work we are doing, he's always been able to uh, show that his equations and the way of thinking about the universe is, is more or less correct, with a few tweaks here and there. That, to me, is unbelievable that you have this, this person who was able to come up with this essentially a humanity changing concept and even 100 years later with the most fabulous technology we still all the images everything all the measurements we make still sort of conform to the theories he laid down i find that absolutely stunning actually it's a, it's remarkable and uh like uh the moment that uh, the moment that we find something wrong it would or even slightly deviant from uh, what Einstein sort of laid out, it would result in likely a, a, an enormous overturning of our understanding of the universe at all levels. Uh, because fundamentally, um, testing gravity if, in these kinds of regimes, you know, it'll also tell us about how gravity behaves on cosmological scales, you know, dictating the, the evolution of the universe and on smaller scales, you know, affecting things like stars and solar systems. Um, uh, and then there's also like the, there's the, less philosophical, um, but also like the scientific interests of, um, you know, black holes as these mysterious objects, right? You know, we, we didn't have 
any real direct evidence that these things even existed until uh, like 2016 with LIGO. And even then it was kind of, you could still maybe argue indirect evidence um, because you were just watching the collision of two black holes or two neutron stars. Um, this was the, for, for a lot of people, there's a fundamental concept of like seeing is believing. And so this was the first yeah. imaged evidence uh, of, of a black, of existence of a black hole in the universe. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, I feel like that's an underappreciated aspect, which is that until very, very recently, black holes were considered kind of a fringe idea. Like Einstein himself didn't think they could possibly exist because we didn't know of any mechanism in the universe that could create such an extreme object. One of my favorite books of all time is this book called uh, Perfect Symmetry by Heinz Pagels. And he talks about black holes. It was, it was written, uh, the edition I have was in the late 90s, I think. Um, and uh in the 90s, you know, he's talking about black holes and he's actually talking about M87 as the best shot we'll have at producing, a, a, getting a, proving the existence of a black hole. But in the book, this book in the 90s, black holes are just a theoretical, like almost fictional concept, like, you know, like a, like a, a trick of the math that could explain some stuff, but nobody really thought they were real yet. Like, right. um, it was a, uh, it was one of those things you could plausibly deny because no one had seen it. And now, you know, in recent years, we've realized that they drive basically like everything in the universe. Um, and, uh, and now we have ex evidence of their existence and that's so, so, so impactful. No, absolutely. And if, in fact, I talked to, I talked to my children about this. I, I have four children, four youngest children. And I talk about the impact of science and measuring things is so important and seeing is believing. But there are a couple of other things you can think of. Gravity, obviously, is one of them. You can think of love. I mean, you can't see some of these things, but yet you know they exist. Um, so that's a really interesting concept about how we accept science in even everyday life versus something you can see versus something you can prove. Did you, say, uh, did you use love as an example of something you can't see, but... You can't see it, but you feel its effect. Well, I think I, I, I would... To absolutely dispute that i think anybody who's ever seen you interact with the kids has seen love firsthand <laughs> no vlbi array required <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah you can uh, definitely I, I do agree with you you can definitely see demonstrations of love mm -hmm. but you know i mean, I, mean I, was, I normally think of in terms of science at least in terms of gravity you know, something you can't really see but you see the effects of and yeah. it's sort of the an antithesis to how we were brought up as scientists is, as you said, seeing is believing, proof is everything, you know, test, test, we test and verify. Everything is related to uh, very sort of concrete uh, uh, substances. The abstract is, is a very difficult thing for a scientist to grasp uh, sometimes, I think. I, and, you know, even this image, these images kind of push the boundary of it. It, it's yeah. to set to, we, we we should probably we're going to talk more about the eht stuff this weekend and uh we're gonna i'm sure we're gonna do a more in-depth you know thing in the future addressing some of the questions people have had about the images but uh despite what you may have heard these are genuine images in that yeah. an image is a collection of fo a representation of a collection of photons received by a detector um uh, and they, there's been some confusion about whether or not they're a real image because they're not an image in optical light, like almost every other image you've seen. They're not an image from a single CCD, like almost every other image you've ever seen. And so there's questions about what makes an image, you know, uh, and these these images kind of lie on that boundary and therefore on the boundary of what we consider direct evidence and uh, uh, or, or, you know, seeing is believing proof. And so there's there's a lot there's a lot of these images that are that are. Uh, than that more than just a mass measurement of uh, the black holes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I would push back a little bit on that. All the most images, at least astronomical images, are, are optical. Of course, James Webb Space Telescope operates very nicely in the uh, in the infrared. Well, what I mean is most images that people consider like images that capture reality as they see it. Yeah, are well, optical. Yeah, abs yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay so, so when yeah when people when people no. are like but is the black hole image an image i don't think they're necessarily thinking about like chandra in x-ray <laughs> no true no that's true yep that's right i agree all right so here's a, here's an interesting one that we should cover and I, i've often asked myself this question and I, I think i've probably got a reasonable sense of it but i think it's a very sensible question for somebody to to ask is that top image you just showed the nice orange donut the top one is from sagittarius sagittarius a star and that's the radio source at the center of Milky Way. 
The lower one was M87 uh, Star, which was the radio source, the black hole at the center of uh, M87, the Messier 87. That's yeah. a, a, a flipped. I'm sorry. I stopped screen sharing because it was uh, having given oh, me yes, the audio. Sorry, you're quite right. 100%. Sorry. You're quite right. M87 that was, my was fault. on top. Sorry, guys. Uh, M8, uh, Psi J Star was on the bottom. Why did we observe these two uh, black holes? Uh, what, was, what, was the, what was the rationale behind it? EHT most... At, like basically the highest resolution scientific instrument uh, ever created. Uh, the resolution it achieved was unprecedented in the history of any image ever taken. Uh, it required an interferometer as big as the entire Earth. And still, these two are the only black holes that are big enough for us to see. One of them is very nearby. Uh, the spot, the Sagittarius star is actually the, the supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The other, M87, is very far away, a thousand times farther away than Sagittarius star, but it's also about a thousand times larger. It's much, much, much yeah. bigger than Sagittarius star. And so they are uh, they're both appear relatively gigantic on the sky. And even with all the resolution we have, these are still the only two black holes uh, that we have enough resolution to observe this feature, this hole in the middle, which is called their shadow. Um, and so it was not, we, we weren't exactly, it wasn't a beggars can be choosers scenario there. <laughs> We, uh, no, true. We, we, we took we pictures lucky. of what we could see. <laughs> that was yeah. it. <laughs> I do love that effect you're talking about, that two very different objects can have very different sizes, real sizes, yet appear apparently the same size on the sky. Uh, there, are, there is another very famous example of that. And it works very nicely. In fact, we'll talk about it a little bit later in this series. Uh, and of course, later on in the season, when we're going to have a very beautiful little uh, eclipse up here in, in the, um, North America, is the sun and the moon, of course. Vastly different size. You know, the, the, the sun is ginormous, that, millions of times bigger than the moon. I can't remember the exact number, but it's some silly number bigger than the moon. And yet they appear roughly the same size in the sky. Well, we can, uh, we, could, we, could, we could probably estimate, right, by mass. I mean, uh, would you say the moon was 1% of the Earth's mass? Well, so 81, uh, 81 moons are in the Earth. 81 moons in there. So, so it's like a, what roughly roughly 1%. The Earth is 10 yeah. to the 26 kilograms. Um, so that's like a 10 of, the moon would be 10 to the 24. The, 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 hang on, the, hang on. The Earth is 10 to the 24 kilograms. Oh, 24. Okay, so the moon would be 10 to the 22. Sun is yeah. 10 to the 33. So uh, 33 no. minus 22. So it's <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, 11. Go, numbers, oh, no. You know, crap, no, your crap, numbers crap. are all over the place. I know, I'm messing it up. It's 10 to the 30. It's 10 to the 30 kilograms. Right. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, the Earth is there's about a million Earths in the sun. Yeah, that's right. So it's about so it's uh, eighty-one, 81 yeah. million moons in the sun. Right. So it's a, a, a order a hundred million uh, times. The sun is an order a hundred million times bigger than the moon. Uh, more, more massive. Yeah, that's more right. massive. Yeah, and yet they appear <laughs> about the same size. Yep. Wow. Which is Which just is, unbelievable. It's a massive cosmic coincidence. And it's a cosmic coincidence that we are incredibly, incredibly fortunate to be alive to see, right? Because the moon oh. is moving, the moon is moving uh, away from the earth. So a couple thousand years ago, no, sorry, a couple hundred thousand years ago, yeah. you may not have ever seen a total solar eclipse because uh, uh, the moon would have been, so sorry, a couple hundred thousand oh, years ago, you may not have seen an annular. Yeah, you wouldn't have seen an annular solar eclipse right. because the moon would have been so big, it just blotted out the sun entirely. And then a couple hundred thousand years from now, which is like nothing in cosmic time, you would have, uh, uh, you, totally you, eclipses, you won't be able to see different. no total eclipse at all, right? Yeah. So it's so remarkable. That, that, well, so that's an interesting uh, uh, sort of set, of set of set of circumstances. Do you have a sense of why the moon is move, moving far over away from the Earth? Uh, the moon's moving farther away from Earth. It's something to do with the angular momentum of the system, but I can never remember. <laughs> well, that's definitely true, of course. The, the system has to leak angular momentum. Do you know where it's yeah. leaking it from? The rotation of the Earth? Uh, sort of. It's actually... Uh, the, what, what is one of the biggest effects on Earth that we know about from the moon? The tides. Yes. And so what it is, what it's, it's um, gravitational friction, essentially, where you're the... the moon makes the Earth's water, the oceans, slosh backward and forward. Well, that dissipates gravitational energy from the moon's orbit, and so it's losing energy, kind of and so it, it's going to get farther and farther away. So it's sort of that gravitational coupling with the, um, the motion of the ocean that the, Earth, the moon is causing. So it's, I find it completely fascinating, actually. 
So um, I know the ocean obviously has the, we see the biggest impact from the tides, but the moon's gravity also lifts up the continents on the, the tectonic plates on the underlying sort of magma ocean by, I think it's like a couple centimeters. Given the the more resistance, I assume, and the uh, fact that it's lifting up at, you know, uh, um, land instead of ocean, do, do you think the ocean has, uh, like the, the tides have a greater effect on the dissipation or do you think it would be the, the, uh, the disrupt, disruption of the land mass? That is a good question. I don't know. The landmass one's a funny one because it's almost as if the crust breathes, right? As as the moon yep. is uh, facing it, so it rises up, and then as it goes around the other side of the Earth with the Earth's rotation, it comes down. So you get this very very tiny oscillation, and in fact, it's measurable. Uh, you can see it in the in the Swiss Alps when they send um, they can detect uh, when they send beams of I think what were they sending neutrons uh, neutrinos? They could detect the deflection due to the, um, the the sort of breathing of the Alps due to the moon. But the, 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 the tides are a wee bit different because they, they dissipate the energy. So they don't store it and then re-release it. It's actually right. being released all the time um, and in a non-uniform way where I think the, 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 the crust sort of breathing up and down in gravitational space is, is pretty uniform. Gotcha. Okay. So that, that, makes, that makes sense. I, I, think, I think I agree with you there. The ocean probably is doing more of a dissipating job. Yeah, I, think, I think so too. It's fun. I love little thought experiments like that, though. Yeah, those are fun ones to think of. Is that really true? Or is this the. It's, and it's also good to rethink sometimes and say, well, I thought this was happening, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's this. <laughs> right. I like that. It's sort of almost fun being proved wrong when you, you think for something through and it just doesn't make sense. Like, uh, yeah. That can't, that can't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was pretty nice. I like that explanation of why we did those two, um, those two uh, objects in particular, uh, Sag A star and M87. Um, one thing I really love that you said, by the way, you said this when we were talking this through before we started recording, uh, the way to think about combining the light from eight or nine or 10 telescopes, the, the, I think we're up to 10 now uh, in, the, in the EHT, is you said you're effectively putting a broken mirror back together. And I think that's a really nice way of thinking about it, where the broken mirror is essentially pieces of the telescope all over, or telescopes all over the Earth, but you're putting the light back together from those telescopes. That was a great analogy, actually. I really like that. Thanks, David. It, it it is pretty accurate to what's being done, except instead of you know piecing back a a mirror like by like a puzzle by hand, you're you're uh, pe putting it back together in a big supercomputer. And I just think yeah, that's such that's a cool funny. aspect. <laughs> All right, here's a question that I'm sure you know the answer to, but it's super super nerdy and super geeky, which I think you and I both class ourselves as geeky nerds, um, chic ones, perhaps as as we try to say in the outro. Uh, Combining all those images from all those all those photons from all those telescopes, how do we combine the right photons? How do we know when they're coming in? Like, do we time tag them? Do you know how we do that? Yep, of course. Uh, so uh, at each of the sites, we have an atomic clock uh, called a hydrogen maser clock that measures down to the nanosecond what time photons are being received. Uh, and then when we put them all together back in the supercomputer, we can line up the timestamps and collect the light that was being uh uh, the we can collect the basically reconstruct the individual electromagnetic waves that were reaching the different sites at exactly the same time. And of course, because the sites are on different points of the Earth, and depending on how the Earth is rotate, uh, depending on how the Earth is, appears to the object, there's going to be different, slightly different time delays uh, for how long the light took to reach one site or another. Uh, and so, as a result, you have to do this incredibly careful balance this incredibly careful like puzzle piecing act of uh figuring out when the light from a single electromagnetic magnetic wave from the black hole hit each of the telescopes individually and uh it's a uh it's an incredibly incredibly complex and cool problem oh it's amazing yeah no when i first started started uh, working for the eht as a program manager at the smithsonian it was just so, so staggering to how well we could time tag these incoming photons I, mean, I think the they craziest did actually... bit was like, I mean, hearing this problem and then you come in and realize it's basically solved because it's solved. The, yeah. because the geniuses that came that are working Before on this it's... now are just too right. smart. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think it's fair to say in most science, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants in the past and we, we take on their, their unbelievable foundational work and, and hopefully take it f further. But it's it's incredible what, what what our predecessors have worked out and being able to solve. Um, and just as you were talking, I did go ahead and check online. I did Google uh, the time resolution of a hydrogen maser clock. 
uh, they can they can measure stable time stamps to within about half a nanosecond. That's half a billionth of a second over twelve hours. That's ridiculous. Which is just stunning, actually, it's when absurd. you think about it. And of course, it's due, it's due to the regularity of the um, of the atomic uh, 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 transitions of the electrons. It's just stunning. You know, um, the hydrogen, the sensitivity of hydrogen maser clocks is uh, the basis of one of my favorite EHT stories. Um, I don't know if you remember this one, but uh, during the 2017 observations, uh, so the hydrogen maser clocks, in order to operate this efficiently, and it's extremely important that they keep the time well, they have to be extremely well cooled. And uh, um, well, uh, in the 2017 observations, one of the hydrogen maser clock, hydrogen maser clock cooling systems broke, basically. And uh, when you're at a telescope, you know, hundreds of miles away from the nearest engineer that could help and the observation starting in five minutes. Um, it's a kind of a problem. And yeah. so uh, it led to one of uh, the funniest hacks I've ever seen, which is uh, they couldn't cool down. They couldn't repair the, uh, the, the, the uh, ast astronomers on site couldn't repair the hydrogen maser clock cooling system. So they just taped the door open to let the let the room cool <laughs> and uh, it led it led there's a there's a smithsonian documentary about the making the image and it led to this amazing line in it where they just like had this dramatic zoom in on the tape and uh, on the piece of tape and the, 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 the announcer just says this incredibly dramatic voice She's like this piece of tape should hold the door open long enough for the uh, data to be collected if not the entire observation could fail <laughs> and it's like it's like well, that's you know, if you wanna if you wanna talk about like it, the healthy dose of luck we needed, to yeah. uh, that's it right there. <laughs> well, I mean, you you sort of uh, this happened in 1919 where uh, they were observing the uh, um, the transit of Venus, looking for the deflection of the star from behind for for to test uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, and uh, one of the sites was cloudy, and then just as they were about to think, oh gosh, we know we've missed the opportunity, it cleared up, and they got the observation and. Uh, uh, yeah, would be uh, they could see the uh, gravitational deflection of this of this object. Which uh, which experiment was this? Uh, so it was in 1919. It was. Oh, it was oh wait, that's not, that wasn't Venus. That was uh, that was that wasn't Venus. That was uh, the Eddington experiment, right? With uh, it was a solar eclipse. They measured the positions of stars before and after. Right? Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. That's what. It, that's right. You're right. Sorry, it was a solar eclipse. But they but they were taking they were trying to calculate the gravitational deflection due to due to general relativity. Yeah. And Einstein had predicted, you know, like a half an arc second uh, deflection, and it turned out to be spot on. That was it. It was a solar eclipse. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, just the luck. It's just, uh, so much astronomy is just, well, I hope it's not cloudy tonight. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but I, I've, I've been on telescopes about 1600 nights, maybe a little bit more of my career. And I've had about 85% clear nights, which is a staggering number. M That's just. What yeah. are you, what goat did you sacrifice? What yeah. deal, deal with the devil did you make to get 85% clear nights? Well, I used to have an observing teddy bear and I, I, I used to always sit in the control room with me. And if, if observing teddy bear wasn't there, if I'd left it down in the dormitories, I was really upset because <laughs> it's going to be cloudy tonight. And uh, it wasn't a one-to-one -one correlation, but observing teddy kept me clear for a long, long time. <laughs> That's very, very funny. And I wonder how much of that is a, uh, if you just had 85% clear nights and you had observing Teddy there 95% of the time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome hey, Teddy, you, you failed me 10% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's, your, what's your P value for observing <laughs> Teddy? Well, it could be sort of the Darth Vader thing of you, you have failed me for the last time observing <laughs> Teddy. <laughs> 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 you remember in Empire Strikes Back where he does the uh, he says, oh absolutely uh, uh, Apple Ozzle absolutely oh, God. <laughs> I still have that Teddy funny enough. yeah that was my favorite part of Empire Strikes Back when he does that to observing Teddy <laughs> <laughs> right, right. well um, look I know we've got a, I know we've got a big uh, we're going to do another episode of uh, DHT coming up soon because uh, uh, it's we're going to maybe have a guest on and we're going to we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about the EHT. So um, I, I, one thing I wanted to maybe move on to, and this is sort of related to what we've talked about with the um, with the distributed network of telescopes. Both you and I have used uh, these robotic uh, network of telescopes that uh, seem to be popping up, uh, one of which is, is a famous one just up the road from you called the Las Cumbres. What 
why do we why do we care? What's the what's the beauty? What's the utility of having a robotic network of telescopes? So uh, Las Cumbres Observatory is slightly less than up the road than for me because uh, I work at it. <laughs> so well, on the yeah. EHT scale, it's up the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. yeah. Yeah. I guess well, sort of, technically, you know. in terms of wavelengths, it's up yes. the road. Well, oh, okay, you, it's in the same. The headquarters is in the same state. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so, um, oh yeah, so Las Cumbres Observatory is a robotic telescope, and uh, here is a map of uh, the, our stations around the world. Um, uh, there... So uh, it's not a robotic telescope in the way that, sorry, it's not a global telescope in the way the EHT is, right? The EHT was a bunch of telescopes uh, placed around the world that all function as one giant telescope. The purpose of this is to have a bunch of independent telescopes that all work synchronously to try to always give you an eye in the sky. So one of the biggest issues with observational astronomy is you spend a bunch of money, you set up your telescope, and then 12 hours later, the Earth rotates away and you're in, you're, you're, it's daytime and you can't do anything except look at sunspots. Um, and then you have, if there's an exciting event going on, especially which is what LCO studies, which is these things called optical transients, which evolve on, the, on human timescales, like the timescales of day, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, um, uh, you want to have as much continuous coverage as possible. So having a 12-hour gap is a serious problem. So basically what we do is with the, EH, with the LCO, we try to have a telescope in every time zone around the world. And if we want to have an observation, basically we always have a telescope pointed at uh, any sort of spot in the sky because there's always uh, a part of uh, the LCO that has nighttime, basically. It's led to our... Uh, our motto, which is this is the real motto of the LCO. <laughs> I am not making this up. It's a we keep you in the dark. Um, nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, no big brother implications there. Um, no. But uh, uh, yeah, so that's the that's the big benefit. Having a global telescope network like this, a telescope in every time zone, no matter what happens, no matter where it is in the sky, we'll be able to see it. And that's uh, just that, that has applications to so much of astronomy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I like I like what you've done there. So I think I think how you've described that is really nice. And so one can imagine observing in Australia, like as you can see here, the big uh, the big um, continent down there in the bottom, in the lower uh, right. So when you start way out in Australia and it's nighttime, uh, the sun is going to be rising from the east. So at some point you are going to come to the point where you can't you can no longer observe in Australia. And if you just zoom out slightly, Joseph, yeah. So one what can happen is. Um, one can move from observing in Australia the same object to then the site up in uh, Tibet and China, uh, assuming the object isn't too far south in the southern hemisphere. And then you can tell that that site can then take over these observations of the same object. So you can continuously observe these very fast transients that are changing on the level of, of minutes, uh, uh, seconds, minutes, hours, such as supernovae um, uh, uh, explosions. Uh, and so I know, Joseph, you, you do a lot of that work. But then as the sun, of course, starts rising, uh, moving from east to west, you can then move over to the, the site in the Middle East. And then you can obviously move down to the site in South Africa, over to Tenerife and the Canary Islands, and so on, until you reach the continental uh, in northern and southern um, Americas. And so what ends up happening is you can get this whole Earth coverage, this longitudinal coverage, and have 12, 15, uh, upwards of maybe 20 hours of nighttime observing in a given stretch. And that's really incredible. Um, and it, you, I think we, we've prepared a light curve that we can show this effect really quite nicely. Yeah, um, so oh, yeah, this we, is uh, yeah, this is the light curve for, an, uh, this is a perfect example of a kind of object where having this coverage was critical to the success of the science. Um, so this is a, the light curve, or basically um, how bright the object was as a function of time. For an object, a brand new object, which is basically, it was predicted but had never been seen before, for an object called a kilonova, which is the result of the merger of uh, a black hole and a neutron star, or a neutron star and a neutron star. I can never remember. Um, but uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, neutron, neutron. I think yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Neutron, neutron. Uh, I think. But so what makes a kilonova special is that it's a thousand times brighter than a regular supernova, which is already a very bright object, um, already stupidly, stupidly bright. Um, so uh, the way the story behind this is basically uh, the when a neutron star and a neutron star or a neutron star and a black hole merge, they produce 
this incredibly powerful distortion of space time that results in something called a gravitational wave, which is a ripple in space and time that emanates outwards from the point of the merge uh, of the collision of the two objects um, and travels across the universe until it's detected by these unbelievable instruments, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, which you may have heard of called LIGO. Um, and LIGO can basically tell us roughly where in the sky um, the uh, the event occurred. But the problem is because uh, uh, we can use other um, instrumentation, it's called multi-messenger astronomy, so we can use X-ray instrumentation and uh, um, and gamma. Uh, if there was a gamma ray burst associated, we can potentially see that. And we can try to narrow down where in the sky this a uh, merger took place. And there's a reason we want to do that. The reason we want to do that is because these objects like this kilonova will produce an explosion that we can actually see in optical light and track via these light curves and get spectra on uh, and do it, these incredibly detailed analyses if we can figure out um, if we can figure out uh, what um, uh, what was the optical event that corresponded to this thing? So uh, if you hold up your thumb, this is a very challenging problem because of how many galaxies there are. So if you hold up the, your thumb and sort of look at the area your nail covers, in that area alone, there's like tens and tens of thousands of galaxies. And so, you know, when we narrow down to a big region of the sky, it seems like, oh, we've narrowed it down to one hundredth of the sky. But that's millions and millions of galaxies, each of which we're looking for a tiny dot. Yeah, a but... new a new star basically that's appeared in one of those galaxies um and so uh uh you know that's a very very challenging problem and you need to do it fast so this light curve this kilonova experienced its peak and its drop within just four days and so you need to be able to scan the sky looking at you know hundreds of thousands of galaxies or if not millions of galaxies to um uh try to find this tiny new spot of light and so because the lco has a telescope in the dark at all times, literally immediately we were able to begin scanning the likely uh, galaxies for this object. And for this kilonova, we found it in less than a day. Um, I think actually in the time scale of a couple hours of searching, we were able to find this object. And then once we found it, um, this tiny speck of light, which I did we include it? No. So um, with this tiny speck of light uh, in this hidden faint galaxy where this merger occurred we were then able to without any break in the uh observation monitor the light curve as a function of time uh and that's just completely remarkable and it allowed us to get this unbelievable data set on this brand new object for the first time which was made possible by the lco's ability to just robotically and automatically search the sky for these for this new object and then immediately continuously follow up knowing exactly which site was going to be pointed at the object at all times collecting data by itself automatically reducing it robotically checking if the reduction was good and if it wasn't getting more data as much as it could it's just all this this feat of uh of technology came together and allowed us to get a glimpse into this brand new object thank you for coming to my ted talk I know, yeah, that's a great test. I'll write that. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to end this and I'll put this up on tab. I think you said a couple of really, you said a couple of really great things there. I think one of the things that occurs to me as well is it, it does, these robotic network of telescopes, um, they don't suffer networks of telescopes. They don't suffer from the frailty of humanity, right? They don't need to sleep. They don't need to go to the bathroom. They don't need to call their mother up and say, hi, mother, how are you doing? I haven't spoken to you for a week, you know, that kind of thing. So they don't suffer from all the necessities of, of humanity that we do. Um, and so, as you rightly said, you know, in, in terms of not, even if it was just not being at the telescopes or not being able to you know, evade the sun as, it, as the Earth orbit uh, um, rotates, it's the fact that it can just continuously observe and take really very high quality data on these um, interesting astronomical objects. So, so we've mentioned a couple of really interesting things. I think you've summarized the, the positives really well. I think the fact that these telescopes uh, give you geo-liberty, as we've been calling it, you can observe from anywhere in the world. You can run these, these telescopes are schedule, schedulable. They are, are um, controllable via, via computer code, which one can do these days from any, anywhere with just a laptop. Um, you, can, you can maximize your schedule versus um, the type of object you're looking at, you can get data at any point of the light curve that you need. That's incredibly observing, um, um, efficient. You can um, 
Also, if you've got multiple sites or, or sites at similar longitudes, and I would say the site in the Middle East and the site in South Africa are fairly similar in longitude, if one is cloudy and the other isn't, you're still guaranteed your observations, which is really nice, very, very nice, uh, very important. One could say the same thing for the telescopes at, um, at Cerro Tololo in, in Chile and the ones up there in, um, is it in McDonald, I think, in, te in Texas, they're up at McDonald? Uh, I believe it's McDonald Observatory. It's yeah. McDonald, yeah. And then, of course, the ones out there, uh, the one out in Hawaii. So the fact that you can get any similar longitudes means you, you can afford for one site to be to be cloudy. Um, obviously, uh, he mentioned the, the multi-wavelength aspect to things. So you can observe in different filters. I think that is really important. Multi, Multi-color, as we call it in astronomy, multi-wavelength observations, very, very important for helping you to discover what type of object caused the um, explosion, be it you know, a kilonova or a super energetic um, a supernova. You can distinguish between those types of objects very nicely. Um, you, you said one interesting term, and I, uh, astronomers use this term in a very throwaway sense, and it always interests me. Uh, we call it data reduction. So we should maybe explain what data reduction really means. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a fantastic point. I did just kind of blow by that. Um, yeah. So uh, whenever you look at a nice astronomy plot showing some data, uh, that is literally 100% of the time, never the actual data that's collected, just raw. Um, so for example, um, when you look at uh, 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 a data point showing how bright an object is, it's just a nice, you know, X coordinate shows you the time and then the Y coordinate shows you how bright it was. But um, for example, with a supernova, you can't just look at a supernova and tell you how bright it is. You have to do this complicated process where first you take an image in a bunch of different wavelength bands, but let's say just stick with one, one filter. Um, so you take an image and then you have the supernova there. And if it's a type two, for example, it might be lying inside of a galaxy. And so you have to take your image and do a bunch of calibrations to make it match a template image that doesn't have the supernova in it, which you then subtract off of just to leave the supernova remaining. And now you have an idea of just the light that's coming from the supernova. But depending on your exposure time and your aperture and all this other stuff, your supernova is going to appear brighter or dimmer. And so you have to calibrate how big, literally, the point spread function of the supernova is relative to other stars in the image that you know the brightness of. And then you compare them and you use that to extract an estimate of how bright the supernova is. Um, and so th this is a very much an oversimplification, but in order to just get that one data point, you basically have to take an image and understand everything in the image as it compares to the, your instrument and the galaxy and other pre-existing estimates of the brightnesses of the stars in these incredibly dense star catalogs. And then, and only then, can you get an estimate of the apparent brightness of the supernova. That's not the apparent brightness of the supernova isn't super helpful. What's actually helpful is what's called the absolute magnitude of the object. So you have to do a step further where you have to estimate the distance to the object, often by then taking a spectrum and measuring lines. And so just to get this one data point, the absolute brightness or the real brightness of the object, you have to measure the distance to the object and compare and do all these calculations. And so um, that's what we refer to when we're talking about reduction, how we reduce a whole image which has the supernova into it in it into a single reduced measurement of the brightness of the supernova that's just one example of data reduction yeah no, that's good that's a good way of putting it uh, and of course one of the big things of data reduction is in fact getting rid of the effect of earth's atmosphere that that tends to be a large part of what we do and the, and the effect of the instrumentation itself actually um the, the, there is a, an historical point to this however uh, certainly when i started which was about 330 years ago was that, uh, <laughs> we were, I mean, it was a while, right? I mean, you're a wee youngster compared to me, but uh, in the early days, so this year I started in the, in the very early 90s of doing this sort of stuff, but you would go to the telescope, you would call your data, you record your data on these big magnetic tapes, and then and they, in those days, the airlines let you, you know, carry them on board with you. But you'd have this, <laughs> these, I mean, seriously, they did. We'd have these big stack of data tapes, like you'd see in the old like, spy movies, and they, they represented some quantity of data. Like back then, it was probably like 25 megabytes. And every time you did a data reduction step, uh, you treated the data for the effects of the telescope or the instrumentation or this atmosphere. The data size reduced. It became smaller. And so in each various steps, you got down to eventually a plot or one data point. And that data point was literally a number. Your supernova is magnitude, absolute magnitude, you know, 
minus 20, whatever the heck the number is, minus five. It's, it's just one number. And so that is a very much smaller data set than the one you started with. So data reduction was actually, you started here with the raw data and every time you processed it and got rid of all the effects of the telescope and the instrument and the Earth's rotation and the, um, the Earth's atmosphere, the number got smaller and smaller and smaller until you ended up with a couple of numbers that you could put on a plot and you'd write the paper. So that I think that's originally why it was called data reduction. That's amazing. Uh, and I mean, it's still, true, it's still true today. If you're reducing anything into a single data point, it's going to be smaller. Even with the images from the black holes, right? Those are kilobyte images that are being reduced yep. from petabytes of data. Um, so, yeah, that's oh, true. wow. You're, so you guys are still using magnetic tape back in the day. Was your first oh, yeah. telescope like a droplet of water suspended on your finger? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that old. I wasn't observing with cavemen. <laughs> Well, <laughs> like, maybe it was. Like, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Simplicico was uh, David James and Galileo et al. No, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, Galileo, you might want to polish that lens before you start. You know. <laughs> the very first observing trip I went on was in, I don't know, 92, 93. It was to the 1.9 meter uh, Elizabeth telescope in. 92? Um, uh, 92, yeah, 1992. Oh, wow, 1992. so that's like just after the Civil War reconstruction was underway? Not 1892, as I said. Oh, well, it's uh, not quite that old. It was in the Karoo region of South Africa. <laughs> guys, guys, just, yeah, just to, David's gray hairs are not from age, they're from me making fun of him. <laughs> yeah, making fun of the fact I have gray hairs, absolutely. Um, <laughs> sorry, well, sorry, I yeah. Put a lot of, I put a lot of gel in today, and the hair's looking quite not too, not too old. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that, that, that was now that was real observing because you you move the telescope yourself. Like these days, you know, you just you know, you tap you tap on the computer keyboard and the, the code or the telescope control system just moves it for you. We moved telescopes back then. We had setting circles on the axe drives. It was phenomenal. Oh um, God, I can't which, even do no, it with like a dab. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> All right, you you and I need to get back together to to. Uh, I'll, I'll teach you how to move across the night sky. <laughs> but um, the one that, that actually sort of at this point is relevant, however, because that's one of my sort of bugbears against uh, these these robotic uh, net, networks of telescopes, fabulous as they are. They are for, for up and coming astronomers and for new and new astronomers, they don't really teach you how to observe. They don't teach you like the conditions of the night sky. They, they don't teach you of the sort of foibles of the telescope itself. Um, which sort of leads me on to the fact that you know we have to, you have to have really good metadata, weather data, uh, all kinds of quality data to understand your data that comes off these um, these robotic instruments. Otherwise, it can be very hard interpreting the data and doing the data reduction. I you know um, I've been doing a lot of astrophotography, both for astroveo and for personal stuff, and it was kind of astonishing how like it was kind of like I knew like terms and you know trivia and i knew what words trivia. Meant. <laughs> like, you know, you know well, it's, it's amazing to joseph Farrow's trivia night what is the aperture of this telescope <laughs> yeah I, you feel like we're, we're joking but like it's amazing how useless knowing the surface temperature of vega was when i was just trying to make a picture of it <laughs> like, um well that's that actually that turns out to be really important because at vega's yeah. the surface temperature about ten thousand degrees which means you know it's color yeah, it's hugely you know it's it's hugely important for what we do like in the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis hugely important cuz Vega is the caliber absolutely important but like when I'm trying to like uh you know when I'm picking an f stop <laughs> to try to collect as much light as possible nobody told me that just going as low as possible isn't the right thing to do and or like when i'm learning about nope. you know seeing and stuff um well for the stuff we do we never have to worry about seeing because uh and seeing is like the condition of the, the turbulence of the atmosphere and how it affects the objects you're seeing but we never have to worry about stuff like that because uh um like that more affects things like planets where you're trying to discern particular surface features and you want to do like lucky imaging so like all this stuff like amateur what you would consider amateur astrophotography um because i spend most of my time working on either robotic telescopes or global networks where i have all the data presented to me in a nice uv fits file i was surprisingly unprepared for actually <laughs> making images myself <laughs> so well, not so surprising though is it joseph <laughs> it was surprising <laughs> to me <laughs> i'm just glad you remembered to take the cover off the top of the telescope <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you, you know, I still, I will never remember to turn the stupid star pointer thing off. The, uh, oh, yeah. Yep. Every time it's good. Just the battery is just going to die one of these days, but oh, I, I'm yeah. sure it doesn't, I'm sure it doesn't help that like, you know, um, I'm sure it doesn't help that, uh, okay. I, I'll make it fun of your age quite a bit. And I apologize. I also get made fun of my age quite a bit too. In like group meetings. It's just, no, it's the source of endless amusement that they will use software packages that are older than I am. Or, <laughs> or people will be like, people will be like, you know, no, oh, yeah, that supernova exploded in uh, 2009. Uh, Joseph, you were in fifth grade, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like, okay, guys, <laughs> like, okay. It's you know, like, you should have said is I wasn't in fifth grade when the light, when the supernova actually emitted its light. It just took that ah, long to get here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it is. Well, uh, I, um, <laughs> I can still remember you making fun of me just not long after we let, uh, met in the Event Horizon Telescope uh, sort of science meetings, and you were you, know, you were tapping away and they were writing uh, uh, Python code, and we so we ended up talking about something, and I think it was scheduling of telescopes or something like this, and I had a Fortran code, and you're like, what Fortran? What the heck is Fortran? <laughs> and and I, I know because you love computers that you knew what it was, but you know. <laughs> NASA used it in the I remember and that joke. I remember that joke. It was it was something it was something dinosaur related. Like, oh, yeah. like yeah. <laughs> ten thousand yeah, lines of Fortran later. <laughs> but yeah, that's right. It's like, oh look, I did this in three lines in Python. I'm like, oh what? <laughs> oh, God. What's the joke? You know, Python, you can do anything slowly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. Well, you know, the, the, this sort of all this is, is relatable, though, because the very first time, like I said, my first observing trip was to the South African Astronomical Observatory. Um, I, I had two I had two weeks. First week was on the 1.9, doing uh, 1.9 meter, doing the um, spectroscopy. I was I was looking at M dwarfs, actually looking for flares that we talked about last week. I was looking for uh, optical flares and H alpha emission from these X-ray selected uh, M dwarfs. And the second week, I had um, a week on a one meter telescope, and it was to do imaging of an open cluster, Messier 7, um, a, a Ptolemy's cluster. Um, and I remember I'd never done imaging Wait, before. I mean, not, me sure, not Messier 87. No, Messier 7. M7. Oh, Messier 7. I thought you said Messier yeah. 87. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not an open cluster. <laughs> no, me Messier 7. It's at the tail, of the, tail of, the, of Scorpius. Right, it's right next to yep. In fact, it's right in the same direction as the galactic center. Very hard to observe because there's so many background stars. Um, so anyway, the spectroscopy, I just, the, the first week was spectroscopy, which is, you know, like taking rainbows of stars. You know, you split the light into its component colors. And I could do that very well. I understood the concept. And the second week was doing photometry, which is just collecting images and working out the, the, the colors and temperatures of stars and, and the brightnesses. Well, I'd never done it before. And I did a bit of reading beforehand. And my supervisor, who was ill at the time, unfortunately, he had a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So he wasn't able to travel to um, South Africa with me. I mean, he made a full oh, recovery, by the way. Yeah, no, he's still... He's still Thank God, that's, that's yeah, a huge relief to hear. Uh, yeah, there was, yeah. He's a, a very, very uh, a, a lovely astronomer. So I went on my own, although the first week I had a professor, Professor Bromwich, uh, he was this lovely old guy and he'd been doing astronomy years and he helped me the first week, but he had to return back to teaching the second week. So they gave me the keys to the dome and it wasn't the one behind me, this, this one, this one in the image, this is in um, Saratololo in Chile, but it was similar, right, the one at uh, the South African uh, Observatory. They gave me the keys to the dome and then I said, right, uh, good luck, I'll see, you, uh, I'll see you at the airport next week. Or, what? I, 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 I've only used one telescope for one week and you were there the whole week. I said, oh, you'll be fine. <laughs> so it didn't, they didn't explain how to turn it on, how to start the computer, how to observe anything. So it took me, it was the first night or the first afternoon, it took me like an hour and a half to open the dome just to figure out the button to open the dome. <laughs> so no! it, 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 it was ridiculous. And I had, very, I, had, I had seven nights of clear weather. It was lovely. It was cold because it was middle of Ju uh, June, which is... Um, Good thing South you got Africa. the dome open. <laughs> oh, I know. Um, anyway, so I observed, you know, took all these, these lovely data of my open cluster. I was able to go back and, you know, match up the stars with the X-ray images I had from, from the Rosat satellite. And uh, the, when, you, when you turn these images into measuring brightnesses and colors and so on, you have these transformation equations, they're called. And you have to calibrate them 
They, and basically what you're doing is you're you're basically taking into account the effect of the filters that you use on the on the telescope and the Earth's atmosphere, which has all kinds of effects on the on the um, telescope system. And there's sort of zero point of where you measure brightness. And that's fundamentally set. And the way you do that is you observe a series of standard stars. And that means their properties are very well known, both in terms of brightness and color and temperature and everything. So when you observe, you take a whole bunch of standard stars, take your science image, take your standard star. So science calibration, science calibration. Well, nobody told me that. And so the whole <laughs> week, I just took a whole bunch of science stars. I took like, you know, 50, 80, whatever it was, science stars, science images, thinking I was brilliant. I had all the data and all this was for my PhD project. And I was thinking, this is phenomenal. I'll be just ready to do my PhD. And I was so happy. So I got back and started doing the site, the data reduction and bought uh, uh, my supervisor, actually, he was a specialist in X-ray astronomy. So he hadn't done photometry either. So it's like, well, I'll look at all the research papers. And there was a great book about, um, about photometry. So I, I, I looked it all through. And then these equations started coming up about how to calibrate your data. Like, oh, whoa, what do you mean equations to calibrate data? Surely I just, anyway, it turned, it turned out you needed observations of all these standard stars. And I hadn't taken one single observation oh my god i'm getting this like, story is oh. causing me physical pain no it hurts and so uh, i had I, I went back the next year in fact i went to a telescope in australia to do it i went back uh, the next year and had to do it all again but this time with calibration stars oh my god were you oh no so it was it was a very hard lesson to learn and right now right here at this i'm at my my dining room table right here right now i could write out that equation for calibrating stars yeah i bet that's burned into your memory oh geez yeah i've got tattoos on the inside of my eyelids but, uh, <laughs> i'm so sorry for your loss <laughs> oh yeah well, it's a hard lesson to learn but anyway but that's i know it's a very long story but that relates no, no, no. to the fact that you know, these story. are these are these are sort of robotic networks they're not very good at teaching students or, or early career scientists in how to observe and that, that sometimes you need that lesson at the telescope to be able to do that so all I've all I've learned about standard stars is that when I don't see a standard star pop up in the spectra inbox, I write no standard star this night in the comment on the observation. And that's the extent of my standard star knowledge. <laughs> yeah, you really need them, actually. In fact, spectroscopy, you need them as well. You need uh, radio velocity standards. You need yeah. telluric, telluric standards to remove the effect of Earth's atmosphere from your spectra. Um, it's flux standards to see how much light you're getting through. It's, it's very important, actually. What we do, yeah, we, we use this, we try to get standards for uh, every spectra observation we do, even more so than the uh, photometry, because we can calibrate the photometry to other stars in the images that are in yeah. catalogs. But the spectra, uh, are, you need more uh, more specific, um, like night by night stuff. I have oh, a yeah. quick quick digression related to your story. Um, I have an image of that region in the Milky Way. Is the Ptolemy cluster in this? I think it's this one, but uh... Uh, yes, that's it. That's it. Okay, that's super yep. cool. Yep, that's super you know how cool. you can see it. So this is M. Yep. Uh, so yeah. So what you're looking at here, was, was actually zoom back out, please. I'm sorry. Yeah. So what you're seeing is, in fact, if you go down toward the mountain, uh, put your cursor down, uh, straight down. Oh no. Yep. Yep. Well, a bit, a bit, a bit farther right. Yep. So there, there are four fairly bright stars above it. One, two, and then one, two. One, two, one, two. Those two there are called the, the two stars of the Stinger in Scorpio, the, the constellation mm -hmm. Scorpio, and they point straight to M7. So in fact, oh, that's, that's, a, that's M7 right there. That's my PhD that's open. That's so book. cool. Yeah. And then, in fact, if you, if, you turn expand, if you zoom in a bit more, if you can, I don't know if you can. Maybe, yep. You see there's a red star there? Right there. Yep. That is the only red giant in the open cluster. That's so cool. That's the oh my god! I wish cluster. my, I wish my data were better. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a bit of a blurry image, but uh, a little bit. Yeah, blurry. it's a, it's, a, it, it's a lovely open cluster. We talked a little bit about this last week, but open clusters are essentially the time stamps of stellar evolution, because you can measure their ages uh, relatively well. In fact, it's on a relative scale, you know, because it's all relative to, to to the sun, which we can measure the age of the sun with. Um, with uh, radiocarbon dating of leftovers of the you know the solar nebula, um, so you know, meteors, meteorites, uh, but we uh, the open clusters you can measure the or systematically and uh, you can age rank them. Uh, very young star clusters like Orion, for instance, you know one, two, three million years old. 
slightly older star clusters, such as the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, so that's 120 million years old, up to the Hyades, which is about 600 million years old. That's in the background of V of, the, of Taurus, and in, 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 the, in the, the V-shaped constellation of Taurus, the Hyades are scattered in and around um, the V of Taurus. And then you move to older and older systems. This one's not too bad. This one's uh, M7 is 220 million years old. So what we do is we measure star clusters of various ages uh, age, and we age rank them. And then we look at the properties as the stars age. So I'm specifically talking about things like rotation, X-ray activity, uh, lithium turns out to be very, very important for, for cosmology actually, um, all the way up to the age of the sun at four and a half billion. Um, and there are a couple of older open clusters we look at as well. And then we get this very, very nice age uh, evolution of the properties of stars. So it's always been my passion, actually, to do open clusters. That's, that's how I started. I, I still do a bit of work in them now, actually. Um, and your work so on I, that has been brilliant. And uh, something you guys should know about David, he has a terrifyingly encyclopedic knowledge of, like, everything in the night sky. It's just insane well, how you can just – it's ridiculous. You have, don't, don't deny it. You are incredibly, incredibly good at this. <laughs> well, thanks. I'm not bad. Yeah, I've got, I'm not bad at star patterns and that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, I, it's so cool that we have, you could just look, I, you did your thesis work on this open cluster. Like this is, yeah, that's I love amazing. This cluster. yeah. <laughs> well, they, they, this is what I took all those images off that I ended up having to throw away the images because they were just, you know, utter rubbish. Uh, <laughs> in fact, you, could, you can see this must be Scorpio. In fact, if you look at the top right, there's a very red object. That's a row of yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't, well, row of is right next door to Scorpio, but I think so you're no, talking I about the top that, right of the image, right? Yeah, yeah. This 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 star here. This is uh this is this is Antares, and then these dust yeah, lanes a, are Rho Fucius. Yeah, that's right. It's Antares, but Antares is the brightest star in I think it's the brightest star in the constellation Scorpio. Um, and it's uh, Antares is so called because as most star names are, it's from Latin. Uh, not Latin. That's absolute rubbish. It's from old uh, Persian because most of our astronomical knowledge of the uh, uh, was, was re, sort of reborn in the Renaissance in Europe, came from Persia. And so Antares in, uh, is related to Arabic, and it means the deceiver of Mars. Oh, because whoa. It looks, oh, because it looks like Mars. <laughs> it looks like Mars. So uh, uh, Antares means the deceiver of Mars. Just, and uh, Mars actually does pass through Scorpio, because, of course, it's one of the uh, constellations of the Zodiac, which means the sun's path passes through that constellation. I always have so a terrible week when Mars passes through Scorpio. Oh, indeed. Terrible week, terrible week. Yeah. Um, it's very beautiful, however, because you see uh, Mars and, uh, and Terry's juxtaposed, and they're just beautiful. We got to get a we got to get a shot this summer. Yeah, let's try and do if, if uh, depending on if if Mars's orbit um, um, plays nice nicely, we we can do that because it's uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful image. Um, but so uh, is uh, Scorpio just stretches across this whole image then? Yeah, it's a really big constellation, actually, on the night sky. Wow. I didn't it's realize huge. that looking at this, actually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you can sort of see the S-shaped tail of the scorpion because the two stars are identified as the stinger. And then it goes yeah. in an S-shape, but it actually goes below the horizon and then comes back up. And in fact, you can see the tail coming back up in that very bright star just come. No, not that one. Other side. Coming up oh, from the mountain. This one. Uh, th that one and the one right coming up right by the mountain. This one? Yep, that one. So, so it's that it's like an S shape. Is that not and another that, open cluster? This one? It's so, it actually does look like an open cluster. You're quite right. There's it's a bunch of these. There's a there's a Ptolemy, of course, and then there's the butterfly cluster. Um, yes. Which creatively uh, named M, and a M yeah. M six or M eight? I can't remember which. Oh, no, uh, M eight is the uh, M eight is Lagoon, I think. Yeah, Lagoon is uh, up here. Yeah, there you go. There's yeah. Lagoon. Yep. Lagoon, yeah. I think the Eagle Nebula. Uh. Yeah, M6, um, M16 and M18. Yeah, I've observed both of those. Yeah. Uh, what haven't you observed, David, to be honest? <laughs> yeah, I've observed most of the sky. <laughs> but this, I'm glad you pulled this image up. Oh. Uh, the, the, just the, the dust lanes there are phenomenal. Just beautiful. Oh, I was pretty gosh, happy with this one. This, oh, is, uh, uh, this is actually my first like real astro photo. I, uh, like the first one that I did calibration frames for and uh, like flats, darks, biases. Um, and, uh, uh, like my first, like, I mean, I got like, I think it was 45 minutes of data. Um, oh, you yeah, I a, them? uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I integrated them and then I did a foreground composite, uh, 
<laughs> so I was like, I was really happy with this one, but I just, it was insane Beautiful. how much, it's one image, how much you could see in it. Like, oh yeah, um, yeah, absolutely <laughs> gorgeous. Those Thanks, dust man. lines, are, yeah, you did a great job there. Appreciate you. Yeah, I know. Uh, I appreciate think, you. You know, you know what's in this image too? Sajay Star, somewhere in there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Not that our eyes can see it, but yeah. <laughs> but the galactics, I mean, we're looking right at the center of the Milky Way with this. Yeah, the like, like I said, I can't remember the exact galactic latitude of of, of um, M seven Messier seven. I think it's four four and a half degrees off the off the galactic um, center. So I suspect mm -hmm. it's just slightly up and above of the um, maybe a little bit less, but it's in that area. Yeah, I'm pretty center. sure the butterfly nebula marks uh, the region where the uh, galactic center is. Like it's somewhere right yeah. around there. So well, the like I said, M seven M seven is really close. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine when I was when I was imaging M7, just the sheer number of background stars that you measure, and then you have to eliminate those from your image uh, with with a, a point spread function that you mentioned earlier on. Oh, geez, that was a lot of effort. <laughs> I've always wanted to do a star reduction on this one too. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. that's a, just beautiful. Um, crazy. Well, given that you've got such a beautiful image up, why don't we turn on, we, we can show some of our other uh, personal images as well. We should probably move to the object, which is arguably one of the most beautiful in the sky, but is, stops you taking images like that. Um, and I, of course, mean our, um, our Earth's uh, natural satellite, the moon. One of the largest satellites orbiting the Earth. One of the largest in the, in the moon solar system, yeah. In the way absolutely. that Gateway Arch is one of the largest arches in St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, the, the moon is still up there, right? I can't remember. It's like the third or fourth figures. But it's actually one of those, it's one of those celestial bodies that is really rather interesting because, of course, everybody gets to see it at some point during its cycle um, in, a, in a given lunar month. Uh, you know, yeah. as you rightly said to me the other day, except during new moon. So, again, you know, a plus or minus a day of new moon, of course, nobody can see it because it's in direct line with the sun. Um, but it's over over history. It's it's dictated an awful lot of our, of humanity, from of times to harvest, times to go hunting, um, times of fertility, um, and of course in, in modern times for us as astronomers, it's it, it, certainly in the optical it can be a real pain in the derriere because it's so so bright. Yeah, you basically can't do any uh, deep sky observation when yeah, the moon's out. That's right. No, no deep, no, no deep sky. <laughs> So, and I know we should probably throw up an image or two, but you and I have actually taken photos of the moon and some of them are pretty darn good, even though I'm biased. I'm you sure. have a spectacular lunar eclipse uh, composite um, they took. Do you want to tell us about how, yeah. this one, how you made it, like uh, the, the, but, the big, what, what this is representing? Yeah, this is a beautiful image. You put together the composite, so I, I, I thank you for that. It's only actually four images, but you, you mirrored them, um, sort of top left and bottom right. And I took this uh, on Cape Ann here in Massachusetts. Um, it must have been a year ago, maybe two years ago. There was a lunar eclipse there. And I can't remember where I was. I was out near um, Plum Cove, um, which is the backside of Cape Ann here. And it was nice and dark looking out over the ocean. Uh, and so what you're seeing in the very center is uh, a total lunar eclipse, or very, very close to total at least. And what essentially you're seeing is the shadow of Earth is passing onto the surface of the moon. Um, but it's not you don't it's, you don't you're still seeing something you're not seeing nothing, and it turns out what you're seeing is is Earth shine. So you're seeing the reflected light from the Earth plus some rays that are going through Earth's atmosphere and still illuminating some part of the surface. So just a and, uh, beautiful. Is the Earth shine always present, and we can just see it during a lunar eclipse, or does it only occur during a lunar, lunar eclipse? No, that's a really good question. I think the answer is no. And I think you, you will have seen this yourself when you see very, very thin crescent moons just after a full new moon. So you're typically seeing this very, very sort of tiny crescent in the sky. You can often see uh, Earth shine on the remainder of the moon. It's not just dark. You can actually see the moon behind the crescent, um, but uh, obviously not very brightly. And that's, that's Earth shine shining onto the dark surface of the moon. Um, so very, very beautiful. Um, and then these other three images, let's say, let's go toward bottom right, is this looks to be in near half eclipse, uh, three quarter gibbous eclipse, and then obviously uh, the full moon, but with no eclipse. So this this progressed as the, the eclipse was, was uh, being observed. And then the other three top left are just mirrored from the bottom right with a 180 degree uh, translation rotation uh, algorithm. But it's just a nice wee sequence that I, taught, I took with a, a DSLR um, with, I don't know what the aperture is. It's probably four centimeters, maybe. It's a, it's a really uh, sort of... Based on the resolution you had here, it looks like you probably went out to 300 millimeters for the focal length. 
Yeah, I was talking about the entrance aperture. Oh, yes. the oh, aperture, yeah, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, the, yeah, not the focal length. The entrance aperture yeah. is, is probably you know, 40 millimeters across, something like that. Um, but yeah, this is probably long, uh, long focal length. But just beautiful, just a beautiful set of images. Um, and you, you have another one that I took, a, 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 yep. oh my gosh, about 15 uh, years ago now. Um, uh, sorry, uh, this one, amazing this one. one. Now this is a very beautiful image. It has a nice story behind it. So uh, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think this was. Where was it? I think it was. I think it was a, just a three quarter gibbous, so or not far off. And this, believe it or not, is through a telescope, a large telescope, actually a one meter telescope, uh, but the with none of the back end optics. In fact, that we had just finished installing it. I want to say just finished, right? The six month process. Um, and we, this was the very first object we, we looked at. It's called a first light image. And uh, believe it or not, it was taken by pointing a, um, um, a telephone. I can't remember what type of telephone now. Is it you know, maybe an, an, an Apple 4 or Apple 5? It was, it was 15 years ago. I can't remember the exact telephone. And we just pointed it at the, um, at the entrance aperture to the telescope. And this is what we, we took. Um, and it's the telescope is the educational telescope on top of Mauna Kea called uh, Hoku Kea. And it was while well, I was a professor at the University of Hawaii in Hilo, and we built this telescope specifically for the educational program there um, at the university. But it was one that it was one of the sort of smallest aperture telescopes on top of Mauna Kea, but uh, produced this beautiful first light image. So I really enjoyed this one. So one of the smallest apertures on Mauna Kea is kind of like saying one of the slowest receivers in the NFL. So like it's still going to be. Pretty big, it's right? Decent. Yeah, still decent. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah so this is, this could... is the telescope that you built with like your bare hands, basically, right? Well, I think I think that's a slight exaggeration. Though. I mean, I didn't build it with my bare hands, but um, it was it was it was built by a company out in Golden, Colorado. I don't know if they're still operational. Actually, I can't sure I can remember their name. But um, yeah, they they built the 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 hardware, the superstructure. You know, polished the mirror. Um, the dome itself, I did it. It was built as a, a local contracting company, but I did, I did put, put that up with my bare hands. There's telescopes of me tightening things down and, you know, point, pushing the crane to install various parts of it. So that that was good fun. Uh, Fourteen thousand feet to do that is is pretty tough because your breathing is a little bit labored, you know. But yeah. um, did you have to wear an oxygen yeah. mask or anything? No, no, you just get on with it. I drove up every day and uh, did it, and then drove back down to sea level. And uh, this was when Benjamin was Benjamin had just been born, actually. So Benjamin, you went from fourteen thousand feet to sea level every day. Yep, every day for about two years. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a hell of a drive. And uh, yeah, get home and feed Benjamin and stick him in the bath and give my wife a or ex-wife, I suppose now, uh, give give do her your, a break. Evening hypoxia vomit and then uh... <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. So, like breathing as much oxygen in for, for the next morning as possible. Hold and, your uh, breath for uh, eight hours. Yeah, that's right. Give 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 me. Well, if I was holding my breath, I wouldn't get the oxygen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I love these stories, the especially like the, this one because uh, you have so much astronomy street cred, like because you like you oh. built these telescopes, like you were a professor of uh, you know astronomy and astrophysics, and and you uh like you you have this incredible um this incredible like history with the subject. You're just you're one of the most qualified credible people in the world to speak on this stuff and i, I hope you guys i hope you guys out there appreciate it. you have access to this dude's mind like he is awesome. this is a very it's not very this is a special thing you, we, we 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 all get to appreciate from you man you're amazing thanks man. i appreciate it don't make me blush but uh, i don't think it's a, <laughs> i feel like gandalf right it's not a function of being clever or intelligent it's just you've been around so long you just pick things up you know <laughs> and and also you died and came back as uh david the extra white Oh, that's right. Yeah, he was. It was he Gandalf the Grey and then Gandalf the White. Yeah, David the British. David the David the Welsh. There you go. Yeah. David the Welsh. <laughs> well, I've always loved the moon. In fact, I think when I first got into astronomy, you know, this was when I was about seven. I think I told my mother I loved astronomy, and she she bought me this small aperture telescope, this sort of little two inch uh, diameter uh, telescope. And of course, the very first thing that one does is you look at either the moon or Saturn. The Saturn's got the rings, like you can see behind you, this beautiful ring system, or the moon, because it's super obvious that when you look through the moon, you see craters and mountains and craters in craters. And oh, I was, I was just blown away. And so I said, Mother, I'm going to be uh, become an astronomer, an astrophysicist. And I was about seven. She's like, Okay. And so she bought me some <laughs> books. And no, she was super supportive. It was, it was very nice. And uh, so I've always loved the moon, always loved the moon. 
and we'll, we should show some of your photos too or some of the other collages we put together but one of the things that really uh, where, where does this one come from so this is um with uh my celestron 6se it's a six inch oh. aperture with i think a thousand millimeter uh, focal length and it was using a dslr um in, into directly into the visual back beautiful look at that look at the craters there on the bottom left yeah. <laughs> I love this one. I, I'm going to, the seeing was not particularly good and I'm still learning how to, I'm still, unlike David, I'm uh, I'm still learning how to do this stuff sort of, uh, um, and we're using like consumer equipment. Uh, but, uh, it's just, it's wild to me how you can, uh, like the, the, what, what blows my mind is the scale. Like a lot of these craters, you know, they're order like a couple hundred kilometers across maybe and tens of kilometers high. And like, that just feels like such a human scale. Like it's mind boggling. Yeah, that's oh, incredible. That's just incredible. Well, I'm glad you're throwing some uh, beautiful image there, Joseph. I'm glad you're Thank throwing you. some numbers out. You're welcome. Glad you're throwing some numbers out because here are some of the basics on the moon. And, and we're going to talk about this in more in more detail in, in upcoming episodes because we have the, the uh, a beautiful total solar eclipse that is coming across North America uh, where, where Joseph and I are based on the East Coast and West Coast, hence coast to coast, uh, in early April. Uh, in fact, that, that's my uh, my third child's birthday on the 8th of April. Uh, Tennessee's going to be, oh my gosh, she's going to be 11. Gee whiz, now I feel old. Um, so anyway, <laughs> You're right. um, Sorry, man. Sorry, man. We got to go see a solar eclipse. <laughs> sorry, so solar eclipse time. Um, happy birthday later. Well, uh, so in terms of illumination, uh, the sun, for instance, is 398,000 times as bright as the full moon. So that gives you a sense that when sometimes you look at the full moon, and you're just blown away by how, how bright it is. It's dazzling. Well, the, the sun is 400,000 times brighter, essentially. So that's uh, that, that's really interesting. Of course, one big difference is the, the sun produces its own light. The moon reflects sunlight. Um, so it's, it's not producing its own light. Uh, in terms of mass, there are 81 moons in the Earth, just in terms of mass. That's pretty big. Uh, distance is a good one, and I'm calling this mean distance, and I say mean because the orbit is not circular, it's slightly elliptical, it's about a 5% egg shape, it's not perfectly spherical, but it's mean distance, it's average distance from Earth is 238,855 miles, which means traveling at the speed of light, if you, if you could travel to the moon at the speed of light, it would take you 1.3 seconds, more or less, to get there. Wow. Which is amazing when you think about it, amazing. Um, bearing in mind, it takes 8.3 minutes from the light from the sun's surface to reach us. So uh, it's incredible. I think a better, I think a better analogy that puts it in scale is it takes one, in one second, light will circle the Earth seven times. So this is like 15 times the Earth's circumference, which is already huge. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing. Now that brings us on to another cool little subtopic, and I, I want to carry on with you, the, the Mars's properties in a second, but I know you know a wee bit about uh, lunar ranging, so, oh, so yeah. tell us about that. So the question is, how do we, uh, uh, we have these estimates for the distance, right? It's like one, one, point, one and a quarter light seconds away from the Earth, 250,000 miles. How do we uh, know how far the, uh, away the moon is? And this is one of my favorite topics because it's, um, it's, it makes, it, to me, it makes the heavens so accessible. Uh, so there's a thing called lunar ranging. Basically, um, when uh, uh, the first uh, astronauts went up to the moon in 1969, they left these really, really big uh, reflectors. Uh, to reflect concentrated light back to the Earth. Um, and the idea is astronomers on the Earth would then hit those reflectors with a laser and measure using a detector how long it would take the light to come back. So, you know, there's light bouncing off the moon all the time from the sun, but you can shoot a laser, which is a very, very specific wavelength, and then collect the photons that are coming back basically at that wavelength uh, and sort of get exactly the light that you sent. Um, and you do this and you can measure the time between when you send the light and when it comes back. And uh, you end up finding that uh, the light takes about two and a half seconds to hit the moon. And so that means the moon is about a second and a, a quarter, sorry, 1.25 seconds or so away by light travel time, which is how we get these distance estimates so accurate. Um, but a, a really interesting question that I think people often ask is like the retro reflectors, you know, are probably the size of like a table. So how do we hit them? so precisely and this is like my favorite cool fact the answer is just 
we don't. <laughs> it turns out that lasers, when you, you know, you take your laser pointer and you shine it on a wall, it parts this nice, perfectly condensed little dot. But if you move that wall away, or, you know, you moved away from the wall, uh, as you get farther and farther away, that dot's going to spread as the dispersion of light becomes more apparent. Um, and so when you're shining a laser beam at the moon, it has to travel so far that by the time your standard laser beam hits the moon, it has dispersed so much that the size of the dot of the laser pointer would actually be greater than the surface of the, the size of the moon as a whole or something comparable to it. So basically, as long as you just point roughly at the moon, you're guaranteed to hit it. And more accurately, you're guaranteed to hit the retroreflectors because the light is being spread yeah. out over the whole moon. And I just think that's the coolest thing. It's like that all these cool. little hacks and tricks that they thought of before they sent the astronauts up to the moon. And now you you can do this. I mean, it's it's not as accessible as like just taking a picture of the moon or uh, just, you know, looking at the, the, the moon through your telescope. But like, you know, with not the craziest equipment, you could uh, you do these kind of lunar ranging experiments. It's not, you know, off the shelf consumer hardware that you'd need, but uh, it's more accessible than like traveling to the moon yourself or oh, stretching yeah. out a tape yeah. measure. So absolutely. Yeah. That's very cool. And also, you know, all the, all the little Martians on Mars see the moon sort of blazing away like a crystal ball from those reflectors. They're probably thinking, ah, those Earthlings, it's party time again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. That would be their way to tell that there's life on Earth. And it's really dumb. <laughs> yeah, that's right. well, it's, it's not that dull. We create a crystal ball, a party bo ball from the moon. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's their way of telling that there's life on Earth and it's drunk as a skunk. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's, do, it's doing too many silly things. Uh, all right. That's really, really cool. I, I, love, I love that lunar ranging story. Love it. Um, Thanks, David. What else? It's, you're welcome. What else? It's got a really cool fact about it, the moon, and it's, it's because it's based on, it, on physics, of course, in that the rotation period of the moon, that's in how long it takes to rotate on one axis, on its axis, is about 27 days. Well, it turns out its orbital period, the time for it to orbit the Earth, is also about 27 days, and they're very, very close. In fact, it's called synchronicity. And of course, one of the most obvious uh, physical manifestations of that relationship is that you only ever see one side of the moon, because as the moon is rotating around the Earth, it also is itself rotating. And so, of course, the Earth's rotating too. And so from Earthling, from, from an Earthling's point of view, you only ever see one side of the sun. It appears to be not rotating at all. It's still orbiting, but not rotating because the periods are matched so, so well. Um, and that, that could be actually one of the effects, as we mentioned this earlier on, about how eventually solar eclipses would be more difficult because the, the, Earth, uh, the moon is sort of leaking gravitational energy into the, into the tidal movements is the rotation will probably slow down as well. So eventually that will go away. Well, I actually think that's how the moon became tidally locked in the first place, right? Is uh, I think it's, what's the explanation for the effect? Like the, the Earth's gravity pulls on the near side of the moon slightly more than on the far side. So over time that causes the rotation of the moon to slow down or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and so eventually it becomes tidally locked. Was yeah, that the explanation? Maybe... I forget if that's the... Well, no, that's a funky one. I think the, the Earth, so that would only work well if the Earth, the Moon were, were compositionally uh, and density uniform, and I don't think that is true. Um, uh, so actually, I think that is the that's at least the basic explanation that's given. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, that, that's the basic explanation that's given. Um, Basically, the Earth's gravity very slightly tugs at the moon, and uh, it applies a torque that slows the rotation, slows its rotation. And over four billion years, uh, tidal torque slowed the rotation, and it eventually became tidally locked. Oh, so it's just in a transition period. It, it, eventually, it will just go out of synchronicity. Um, that's a good question, actually. I don't know if that's true. Well, eventually it must be true. What well, one would imagine, if it, as, as you mentioned earlier, the, the moon is pulling away from the Earth very, very slowly. Eventually, the distance will be so large that the gravitational effects will be low. Uh, as we talked, but, we talked uh, about this last week with binaries, about them being tidally locked. Right. So, uh, but isn't tidal locking, isn't it uh, some sort of stable equilibrium? So it would be difficult to... Uh... It would be difficult. It is, ex except, yes, except in a system that's leaking gravitational energy, which the moon oh. is because of the oceans. 
So uh, I know I know all the other large moons in the solar system are also tidally locked with their planets. Um, and I feel like that feels like too much of a coincidence for it That's to true. also. <laughs> well, unless they go in and out of synchronicity often. Because of course they get oh. hit by things as well. Interesting. Yeah, okay. I, I actually don't know the answer to that. That's really interesting. I, I don't know that answer off the top of my head either. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> right, that's, that's a research topic for us. Yeah, we got to well, we dig into that. Yep. Well, we, we, we as, as I mentioned, we will have a future episode on the moon because of this relationship with the um, <laughs> of eclipses. So we should. We and we will have a it. better answer for you then. <laughs> well, well, not only a better answer, we'll do what all good scientists do and not go away and research it. Yeah. Which I think is the right thing to do. Um, so, okay, I do want to touch on one quick thing because I think it relates directly to eclipses, which I think we can discuss briefly before we do our um, our big big episode on this prior to the eclipse. Is that the or the orbit is slightly elliptical, which means it's not completely circular. Um, it has about a five percent ellipticity rate. Uh, it also is not coplanar with the solar system, the general solar system. And what that really means is, if here's the sun and here's the Earth. The moon isn't directly in line, so you don't have a nice line, Earth, a moon, Earth, Sun system. They're not lying on a straight line. It turns out that the orbit of the, uh, if that's the ecliptic plane of the solar system, the moon. I'm exaggerating enormously here. That is the orbit of the moon. It's about five percent tilted. And of course, that explains very nicely why there aren't lunar and solar eclipses every month. Is that? Is it five percent tilted? It's five percent. I checked before we we put this. Uh, is it? This... I thought that was the five percent eccentricity of the orbit. They're both about five. Oh, they're both five percent. The number yeah. of coincidences with the moon and the sun is just like, yeah, <laughs> it's like... yeah. There's a moon and the Earth and the sun. Yeah, it's a, it's. A, I mean, I I don't know the answer to this. Whether it is to do with that, whether they are coupled, especially the fact that the moon is has been hit by various things. But I I don't know. That would be interesting to see if those two are coupled. We can check that too. Okay. And it is 5%. And what that means is that naturally is you don't get solar and lunar eclipses every single month, which is, I thought was really nice. You only get them when they, the, the moon and the earth pass through what are called nodes. Um, and I'm going to put some, I'm going to put some, I think we just, just discussed, sure. we're going to put some teacher, some teacher notes in the comments below so that teachers um, can present some of these ideas to their students. And so given that we're thinking about eclipses, why don't, do you want to take us through uh, what this, this looks like a solar eclipse? Yeah. Uh, well, any eclipse uh, is basically an occultation, um, which uh, basically just means you have something passing in front of something else. Um, so in the case of a solar eclipse, the moon is passing between the sun and the earth and casting a shadow. In the case of a lunar eclipse, the earth is passing between the sun and the moon and casting a shadow. Actually, um, you can use the lunar eclipse to reconstruct the Earth's shadow. This is an excellent image uh, from a Redditor. So you can construct the shadow of the Earth, and this is how the Greeks knew that the Earth was round, um, uh, because they could see the rounded shape of the shadow of the Earth and the Moon. Uh, and so, uh, for the when the Moon passes between the Sun and the Earth, there's this very dark region where basically no light is getting through from the Sun, uh, and that produces the umbra of the uh, eclipse. But then there's an, a, a region where you get sort of a uh, uh, there's a region where you get like a more partial le letting in of light, and that's the penumbra. Uh, if the moon's not directing, blocking the light completely, because uh, some of the light from the sun can still get around it. Uh, and so, but basically, every eclipse, every occultation functions this way: you have light source, occulting thing, and the eclipse is the shadow being cast on the uh, on the object. Um, I regret not pulling this up beforehand, but we've actually made movies of. Uh, eclipses on other planets that you can do with your home telescope um oh, that would have been <laughs> i want to pull that up but uh uh okay, yeah so yeah. well maybe, yeah. maybe yeah sorry to interrupt yeah maybe for that for when we do the full episode for just before yeah. the eclipse in april we, we can um we should bring that in because that's a very nice work and it's also i think it's nice showing referenced work from from nasa or, or pearson education or you know these various um really nice sites that we, we visited. But I think when we produce our own images, it really does run home the fact that we're not, we, we're just doing, we're doing these podcasts because we love astronomy. We still, we are still active in astronomy. And this, yeah, is, this, is, it, our, yeah. this is our passion. People ask that. It's a fair question. Like, why are you making an image of this thing? You just go on Google and find it. It's like, find better ones. It's like, it's not what it's about. It's like, I just, we just enjoy doing this. So like. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you and I have discussed this. Uh, I think you and I would do something like these podcasts 
even if nobody watched them. Because not a single person. <laughs> because we, 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 we talk about this kind of stuff when we talk about most Sundays anyway. It's, like, oh, this <laughs> yeah. is just, it's not just how we talk sometimes. <laughs> Not to diminish the contribution of, our, of whatever viewers we have, but to be honest, guys, the idea was not to have a podcast. It was just to record the conversations we have anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're right. rambling for hours to each other about the new space thing we heard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of true. Yeah, no. And well, hey, we... if you're listening this long, you're as guilty as we are. That's <laughs> right. That's right. You be careful. That's right. Um, so uh, you did throw just throw one one very very nice aspect you threw there right at the end that that Pearson education image. Uh, this I wanted to show because I think we're going to put I'm going to put it in the teachers notes that we're going to prepare and and to distribute with these videos so that the teachers can present some of these ideas to their students so uh, in middle school and high school when they when they're doing their astronomy uh, segment. Uh, it turns out eclipses can be predicted. And they're predicted because there is an 18-year cycle of lunar and um, solar eclipses. And of course, you almost always get lunar and solar eclipses together, just because when one happens, it naturally two weeks later, the other one happens. Uh, but this is, a, this is an example from when I was teaching solar system at the University of Hawaii that I put together. This is, a they're called Saros cycles, these 18-year cycles. And each of these lines, each of these, these gray, green, and red, uh, crimson lines you can see, are various types of eclipses that you can see uh, across the Earth's globe over a period of about, um, well, is it the full 18 years? I don't know if it is. Yeah, it's pretty close, uh, actually. Yeah, it is. Uh, the, the so, looking, yeah, it goes from see, 2008, 2005 to uh, well, no, look, 20... Look down here in, Ant in Antarctica. It's 2003, oh, 2003 to, 2021. to 2021. Yep. Right. So I think, uh, I, think uh, I remember this one, in fact, yeah, this 21st of August, 2017. In fact, I observed this one in Oregon with my children. So this is, that was a, that was a total eclipse. I think the green Of the ones, heart. Oh, that was lovely. Look at you bringing Bonnie Tyler into it. Bow, bow, bow. Very, very, very impressed, very impressed. Thank you, thank um, you. And then these others uh, uh, could be, uh, I am actually can't remember the exact uh, color scheme here, but the I think the annual eclipses were these two in, in, um, in Antarctica. The green ones. Uh, 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 no, the, the red ones. Oh, the greens are total. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, but, but I, 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 no, I there was an total... annular one. There was an annular one in 2023. I think these might just all be uh, total. Yeah. yeah, maybe they're just total then. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because there there was an annular one in 2023 across the West Coast that I don't see. But the 2017 one that was the 2017 Great American Total Eclipse. Yeah. Um, There's the one coming up in April, uh, which is um, yeah. We'll, we'll, I'll be watching yeah. it I hope, in uh, in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so you can get these maps of the cycles of of uh, eclipse systems uh, for the Earth, Moon, and Sun, and they repeat on about an 18 year cycle. Mm -hmm. That was very uh, very um, exciting. So um, yeah. So, so if you're curious about how if you're curious about how astronomers predict this, and when they say, "Oh, this next eclipse is coming up," here's where to see it. <laughs> We literally have the ability to uh, to predict this so accurately because um, yeah. we have such a good understanding of the Earth Moon Sun system. Yeah, the the orbital mechanics specifically. Mm -hmm. Well, this wraps up another presentation for Astroveil, where we go from geek to chic by sharing our passion and excitement for all things scientific, especially astronomy and in the mysteries of the universe. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. And in the comments below, please leave us your suggestions for future presentations. We'll get right on it. And don't forget, you can join us on our journey by subscribing and hitting that bell. He's Joseph, and I'm David, and together we're Astroveo. Thanks for watching.